times. How is he going to return? And of course, one of the main things is when is he going to return? But we can't answer that one. But we can answer how. And we're going to go to probably one of the better places. And he is good enough to us that he tells us what you should be looking for. And don't ever, ever forget it. Because that's when, that's how you know when. And it comes within the word itself. So let's go to the very end of the Old Testament, the great book of Malachi. The Lord was teaching here in this book of Malachi, and he wasn't happy with preachers. He wasn't happy with priests because they were teaching traditions of men and what this organization said or that instead of what God had to say. And you know, God's a little bit jealous about that. When God tells you, you're either going to do it this way or you're going to die, and some fluff head comes around giving his advice, well, it makes God kind of angry at the fluff head. All right? And that's, that's just a little old country name, you know, for, for someone that doesn't have enough intelligence to listen to the Father. This is his word. Christ was the Logos, the living word. He was with us. He walked with us. And um, so within that, that's about the best advice you can get. Malachi chapter 2, let's just pick up verse 1 here. We're going to rush right on through this. And now, O ye priests, this commandment is for you. If you will not hear and if you will not lay it to heart, to give glory into my name, saith the Lord of hosts, I will even send a curse upon you, and I will curse your blessings. Yea, I have cursed them already, because you did not lay it to heart. So it becomes, and that, that curse is not a threat. Not a threat at all. He withdraws his blessings from any priest or preacher that will not do it his way. What, he's got, what has he got to do then to make ends meet? Beg. You can either be a teacher or you can be a beggar. And then I'm, I hate to say that. You, many of you are looking at me like that's a shock. But uh, if you don't recognize a beggar when you see him, I don't know what to tell you. But a real man or woman of God doesn't have to beg. Because God's word takes care of its own. God doesn't like that. What is that curse? You're going to know before this day is over. Okay, now to the very last verse in this particular chapter, verse 17. You have worried the uh, Lord with your words. That's not nice, my friend. You don't want to worry the Father if you ever expect to have any blessings. He's got feelings just like yours. If he gets wearied at you, he's going to say, get out of my sight. Okay, yet ye say, why in him we worried him? When you say, everyone that doeth evil is good in the sight of the Lord, and he delighteth in them, or they'll say this, where is the God of judgment? In other words, we've been going on for years and years and years. Where is this God you're talking about? Well, you know, from the way some people present him and the way blessings flow into certain works, I can understand how some people would say that. Is there even really a God? Because they sure never see much evidence of it other than what is prearranged by man. I want you to underline the word where as it is used in that verse. The word where as it is used here is ayah, ayah. And it means... It, it, it means uh, it is a, it is a pro prolongation of I, I, which is to say how. And the, the question in the Hebrew manuscripts is how is he going to come? Okay. And, and hang on to the word judgment. Okay. When does God come as judge? Okay. Now what we're doing is setting the time phase here for you. God through the Son, came as a lamb to be slain. He did not come as a judge. The only time the God of judgment, in other words, that chapter 2 is just full of judgment. 
But what I'm going to do to you here and what I'm going to do to you there. And they're saying, where is this God that's going to do all this? Stick around, <laughs> okay? But what it's saying here, he's going to answer them in chapter 3. He's going to answer uh, A, the prolonging of the uh, shorter form of Ea, how he's going to do it. And basically the signs you will see when he does it. That is to say, makes his return. Chapter 3, verse 1, Behold, I will send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek, this one you're asking about, shall suddenly, not, not long drawn out, suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant, this Messiah, whom ye delight in, behold, he shall come, saith the Lord of hosts. You don't have to wait around. He will return. You that would say, well, where is this God of judgment? Again, that means second advent. All right? I hope you understand that. He didn't come the first advent to judge. He came the first advent to pay a price. Here's some of the things he'll be doing. Make note of it. Verse 2. But who may be, but who may abide the day of his coming? And who shall stand when he appeareth? For he is like a refiner's fire, and like fuller's soap. You know what fuller's soap is? That's lye soap, right? Like your grandma used to make. I mean, it's pure old lye. It's very cleansing, but that's what it's going to do. <laughs> I don't know how many of you have ever seen lye work on a bad spot, like a grease or something. Well, it does a wicked job on it, okay? And there's nothing to mess around with. I'm not advising anybody to go home and buy a can of lye and check it out. But it can blind you and many other things. It's vicious. It'll just, it'll just eat it up, bubble and boil it, and it's gone. Right? Well, that's the way he's going to do people. If you're a fake standing in front of him, his judgment, in as much as he is a consuming fire, the rudiments, which is to say the evil part of anything around him, will dissipate rapidly. I mean, by that I mean it won't get by him. So you know how a refiner's fire works. You put a little chunk of ore in there and the fire is hot enough that the silver goes to the middle. And the trash goes to the outside and is dumped, called slag. So when the Father, who by the Holy Spirit, brings the fire upon the deeds of man, you want to make sure what's written in the book by your name. It's very important. Verse 3, And he shall sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi, and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. Well, what is it saying here? Well, who, who was Levi and who were the responsible? It was a priest. We're still talking to preachers here. I'm going to start with them. Now, I'm going to tell you something, my friend. I would hate to be teaching God's word and be forced to bring in a church system or doctrine to go along with it. It's too close to judgment. And it's too close to judgment for man at any moment. Because I tell you what, the penalty for it is severe. It's like we were just studying in the book of Lamentation. The priests all had on bloody garments. Why? They had taken many people, they had murdered them, spiritually deader than a hammer. If somebody misleads you as a preacher into worshiping the false Christ, he murdered your spiritual soul into teaching you to worship the enemy, causing you to spiritually die. And you think your father's happy with that? No. So you want to be very careful when you plant seeds. Make sure you know what you're doing, because you will answer for it. And God forbid that I make someone afraid or cause someone to be afraid to plant seed. This word is not that complicated. It's simple. And God intended that the simplicity in which he taught it would be passed on, repeated, repeated, repeated. 
He's going to check out the preachers. That's what he's saying. Verse uh, 4. Then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years, even in ancient years. God loves his people when they obey him. And if you, want, if you really want him to bless you, you want to remember that because he won't otherwise, all right? He just will not bless you if you, in your heart, don't truly want to please him or be pleasing. And, and this doesn't mean you've got to turn into a holy Joe or something like that. And God forbid that you'd misunderstand me. Uh, to me, a holy Joe is somebody that's putting on religion. You know, I mean, just a, just a holy, he couldn't help a sinner because it would rub off on him. And we're sent here to help sinners. And I hope you know what I mean by that, by not being a holy Joe, you know. That drives people away from Christianity more than it draws them to it. And don't think I'm saying that gives you license to sin. You would not understand what I was saying. But, but by the grace of God, that sinner going there could be you. And, you know, when you can say one word that might prevent someone from worshiping the Antichrist, do you realize what you've saved them? An embarrassment, disgrace. It's awesome. Think about it. So the word is powerful. It's truth. Verse 5, and I will come near to you to judgment. So this definitely wasn't the first advent, all right? And I will be a swift witness against the sorcerers that sorcerers or drug users or drug pushers, preferably. Mm -hmm. As you know, in the Greek, it comes from our word pharmacy. It is the Greek word pharmacia, which means where we get our word pharmacy from. It means people that get on spiritual highs. Oh, did you see that red rainbow? I see pink elephants. <laughs> you, know, you can see most of anything. God doesn't like that kind of stuff. If he wants you to see something, he has every ability to show it to you. All right? Without you getting all uh, doped up. There will be no sorcerers in the heaven. And against the adulterers, and against the false swearers, and against those that oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me. Fear means reverence, not what I teach. I teach you how to stay out of trouble. I teach you how to avoid worshiping the false Christ, which is the paramount issue in this generation is being deceived. Why? Because God himself said, if you want to be deceived, I'll help you. I will send you strong delusion. So, but for the sake of God, you must stay out of that lot. He will even help you. If you well, maybe I should listen to this instead of God's word. You're already on the wrong track and you are headed for trouble and God will judge you. You must reverence what he says. That means to love him and respect him because he loves you. Verse 6, for I am the Lord, I change not. Therefore, you sons of Jacob are not consumed. If I didn't love you, I could consume you in a hurry and get rid of a bunch of you. Because we all fall short. You know, let's, let's be honest. You, you better be honest with God. We're just not uh, capable, I guess, of holding the straight and narrow 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. We just slip. But that's what the price was paid for, and that proves and documents his love to you. All right, verse 7, listen carefully. Even from the days of your fathers, you are gone away from mine ordinances. That's the problem and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, when shall we return? But I go to church every day. Go to church every Wednesday. Go to church on Sunday. Go to church on Saturday. And I hear this preacher. He reads one verse, and here we go. We just have the biggest old pie suppers and auctions and all kinds of stuff. And just, woo, we just have get on a high. You know, just have a great time. Well, do you ever get around to studying God's Word, His ordinances? 
what it is he wants you to do for him? Did you leave him out? Because you see, what he said was conditional. You returned to me, and what was the subject? Ordinances. You return to them, then I will return to you. Hey, honey, you don't return to the ordinances, forget it, you're out. Gone, goodbye. He's not coming to you. He's not going to return to you. So you see, I say that in a firmness to drive home the point that God has feelings. And when he makes a deal with you, that's exactly what it is. He said, you return to me. Now, now I want you to catch something else. Did he say, Israel return to me? Did he say, Judah return to me? Did he say, church return to me? No, he said, if you, as an individual, return to me, I will return to you. So the choice is all yours. Balls in your court. Play ball. Right? right there. So, you see, you formulate your own life, and we live in a crucial time of where, when, and what, and how it is that God returns to us, what he's going to be doing when he gets here, and for some, it's not going to be as good as they thought it was. Because you can very easily, if you don't pay attention, violate these laws, even in their simplicity. It is true that many of the ordinances were nailed to the cross, but as a student, you should know which ones are. You've had time, you should know, and know how to go ahead and follow through. God is the same yesterday, today, and he will be forever. He doesn't change every day to where you can't keep up. He's not that difficult. <clears throat> I want to, I'm going to skip the next few verses. I want to go all the way to the 13th verse where he picks up the subject of his return again because that's the subject I want to handle here. Verse 13. Your words have been stout against me, saith the Lord. Yet you say, why have we spoken so much against thee? Now this should remind you of uh, in the book of Luke where they would say, well, Jesus, Jesus, I'm so glad you're back. Oh, man, we have cast out demons in your name. We have done this. And he says, get out of my sight. I don't know. I never knew you. Why would Jesus say that? Because they're playing, playing church instead of sticking to the scriptures. That's why they say, well, God, how possibly could I have told you I love you? You won't listen to my word, stupid. Okay. I can say that. He wouldn't. Okay. But it's true. It is true that people will listen to man's words rather than the scripture. It's really kind of sad. 14. Ye have said it is vain to serve God. And what profit is it that we have kept his ordinance and that we have worked, walked rather mournfully? That means in black before the Lord of hosts. Well, in the first place, you shouldn't walk in black. God's not dead. He's very much alive. And he's something we should rejoice about, not mourn about, all right? He, he doesn't like people that say, well, what kind of burden is God going to put on me today? He's not. You do. You put your own burdens on yourself. So if you want his blessings, do it his way. It is so easy. Stop and think for yourself. Never let a man or some organization do your thinking for you. Do you know what that is? That's a cult. That's an out and out cult. I don't care if it's got the biggest name denomination behind it. If it does your thinking for you instead of you doing it for yourself, you're in a cult. Verse 15, and now we call the proud happy. They, they that work wickedness are set up. We, we put them on high. Boy, I mean, how that man can handle a mean hammer of ripping people off. Let's vote for him for mayor. Or, you know, if you live here somewhere, you might even get your governor to be president. You know, oh, he's good. Wow, it gets it done. <laughs> Something like that. Wickedness and set him up. Yeah. Yea, they that tempt God are even delivered. I mean, it would seem like that uh, they get away with it, doesn't it? Don't worry. It's in the book. 
It's in the book. Verse 16. Then they that feared the Lord, that's with reverence, re reverenced him, spake often one to another. You all do that, beloved. I want to compliment you on it. I know I've heard you. And the Lord hearkeneth. Do you think the Lord doesn't hear that? I'm talking about you. When you talk about the Lord with reverence and how wonderful it is to serve him, it makes his day. He's very much alive and he hears you. He hears your conversation. It makes him feel good. And heard it. He hearkened and heard it. And a book of remembrances was written. You sharpen up for me. A book of remembrances was written before him for them that feared the Lord, that reverenced him, and that thought upon his name. Boy, are you in the book. And it's in the book. But that's a positive. It's a very good positive. We're not playing church. We're reading God's scripture. And he said, I will hear you if you love me. That's why it's important that you let him know you do love him. That you respect and reverence what he said. Then he puts you in the book. And um, I don't know. Well, I, I dare him to say it's money in the bank, but maybe it would get some people's attention. It's better than money in the bank because he's going to put it in there for you. And I, I don't like that. Don't like that at all. He's going to give you blessings where you're going to put it in there, right? He's going, he's going to kick the rocks out of the road for you where you can be a can-do type person. Take names kick dragon, all right? I mean, shape it up and get it going your way. He hears you. Why? If God hears you and he puts it in your book by your name and he starts kicking the bullies out of your life as best, if, especially if it's one you can't handle, if it's one you can handle and it's a bully, hey, take names, kick dragon. He doesn't have to waste his time. You can do it, okay? But I'd like for things to be nice in my life. Well, it is. It's real nice when you take a bully and put him in their place. All right? It's just real good. Because it means you've got a little starch and God can use you. At the same time, if you have compassion and you can love a helpless child or someone else, that's all the better. But they both go hand in hand. It's called love. Real love. Sometimes tough love. But um, because it is in the book, I want you to go with me to Psalms 56 real quickly. Hold your place there. We're coming right back. Psalms 56. Just love these Psalms. Verse 8. Psalms 56, verse 8. Uh, and what he's doing here, be merciful unto me, O God, for a man will, would swallow me up. He, fight, he fighting daily oppresses me. I mean, life's not fun. And that's what's being said here. A man will just run right over you if you let him. All right? And that's what uh, David is saying here. Now let's pick it up in verse 8 and get to the, stick to the subject. Thou tellest my wonderings, put thou my tears into thy bottle... They are not, are they not in thy book? I want you to think about that a minute. Do you know that every time somebody offends you, it brings a tear to your eye, it goes in the book. God says, don't mess with my children. Touch not mine anointed. It's in the book. Do you think God isn't going to get even? Vengeance belong up to me. But the tears in a bottle and recorded in the book, the book of life, the book of truth, the book of facts that we are judged by. Verse 9, when I cry unto thee, then shall mine enemies turn back. This I know. I'm not guessing. This I know for God is for me. In God will I praise his word. 
emphasis. In the Lord will I praise his word. It's his promise, promise to you. Reverence my word and I will love you. I will put it in the book. 11, in God have I put my trust. Don't you dare ever put it anywhere else. That is to say your ultimate salvation or your search for and quest for truth. I will not be afraid what men can do unto me. 12, thy vows are upon me, O God. I will render praises unto thee. God takes care of that that you can't. You take care of everything you can and then put the rest of it in his hand. 13, for thou hast delivered my soul from death. Wilt thou, wilt not thou deliver my feet from falling that I may walk before God in the light of the living. That means in eternal life. That I can walk there. That I've earned it. That I've deserved it. I don't know. You set the rules of your life. You're in control of your life. You can have it good, or you can be like some people that just get along from one paycheck to the other, which the paycheck has nothing to do with it. I mean, that's where their mind is. But beloved, you can put your mind on much higher ground. You can have your name in the book. It's there already, but it may be bad stuff if you're not paying attention to it. Why not repent and get the bad stuff erased and get some credits there? Because that's going to be what you're going to wear on Judgment Day. I can't wait to see you all. Mm. Yeah. It forms the righteous apparel, right? So, and and I, my Irish just won't let me go straight too long till it does that. But you know what I mean. I say that lovingly. It's something we need to think about and be conscious of. Because quite frankly, in this generation, I don't, I, I'm not comfortable with this term, but I'll use it. You should be making points with God. You really should be. Because that's how you get ahead, really, for eternity. This living and walking, you know, that doesn't mean down the street, say, whoa, 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 look at me. You know, no, that means, he, that means forever. Down the streets of that city of gold, though that simply means pure. That means you got it made, that you made it. So think about it. Think about the book. It doesn't hurt. If Christ is the logo, certainly the book is not that bad. But there's a record there. And you know, I don't know, most parents like to see their children's grade cards when they, you know, report cards. And God likes to look at yours. And remember how good it made you feel when you could bring a real good report card home and say, boy, this ought to be good for a buck or two. You know, back in my day, kids now, maybe I'll get a 50. Whoa. You know, and they do. You know, I don't know. It didn't used to be that way. You know? I can remember when a nickel, you know, and 10 cents for the movie was, that was it. 15 cents, week's allowance. You know, but it was a bunch then. What has that got to do with this? God rewards his children. He does. <clears throat> You should not serve him for that fact alone, but for the fact he loves you and he likes to bless you. Do you know what? He owns everything and he wants to bless you. So let him know every day. I, I know I harp at you about that, but beloved, it's important. It makes him feel good because he's got feelings and sometimes we hurt those feelings. We disappoint him terribly. And I'm sure that there's a tear comes in his eye when somebody he's learned to count on pretty good all of a sudden lets him down. You know, it's, it's like, now I thought I could put more on that one and that. And I, I reference Job, you know. But there we have it. God in the light of the living, because the living, that is to say those that eternally live, uh, they have that. Malachi chapter 3, verse 18. Then shall ye return and discern. You know what discernment is? That means make a judgment between the righteous and the wicked, between him that serveth God and him that serveth him not. Do you think God doesn't know the difference? The book's got it. 
God knows everything. So that's why it's important that in your daily life, you take time. Think about the book if it helps. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing at all wrong with it. Wonder what I got on my list today. Oh, Lord, I repent. You know, just make sure you keep it updated. You know, you know it's, it can get kind of out of hand, you know, and make sure you talk to him more than just every once in a while. The main time, one of the main times you want to talk to him is when you know you better. All right. Say, Lord, I did blew it today, didn't I? You know, and, and don't worry, he knows you're not perfect. I mean, look at yourself, you know. <laughs> Chapter 4, verse 1. Y'all are awake, aren't you? That's one. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I turned the page here. Huh? Chapter 4. All right. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven. Now, now, bear in mind the subject. How is the Lord coming? The day cometh, it's going to burn like an oven. And all the proud, yea, and all that do wickedly shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith the Lord of hosts, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And, of course, this looks forward even to the end of the millennium. What he's saying, we're going to build up that lake of fire. That's the only time he does this, okay? Other than that, he is a consuming fire. And we're going to throw them in root and all so that no other root of wickedness can sprout forth. And that's important. I know a lot of Christians are very tender hearted and they think, well, I just wish we could save the wicked. Well, God does too. But if they persist after they've been brought to the truth to be wicked, we don't need them. That's why we have the trouble we have today. And God is a discerner. It's in the book. The book will tell, and that's it. Okay? That's why you want to pay attention to the book. And I hope I'm not making book worshipers after this. Don't worship the book, all right? Worship God, but care about the book. Okay, verse 2. But unto you that fear my name, that's to say reverence it, Shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall, or calves freed from the stall. I don't know how many of you have ever had the pleasure of seeing a bunch of little calves pinned up all winter and then just see them turn loose. They just go bananas. Happiest little creatures in the world. Oh, they have a time. I just love to watch them. He said, you'll be that happy. And he said, do you know something else? He said, he's going to bring healing. Healing. Well, S-U-N of righteousness. What does that mean? It means Messiah. Okay? As you all know, this was when John the Baptist was conceived. And it was kind of a miracle birth. Verse 76, Luke chapter 1, and it reads, And thou, child, speaking of John, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation unto his people by the remission of their sins. That means by their repenting and getting their name put in the book the way it should. Now, bear in mind, we're talking about the first advent here. Understand? Okay, John the Baptist, 78. Through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring, that's the sun rising, or the righteous sun, or you can even call it the branch if you want to. It means Messiah, all right? The day spring from on high hath visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in shadows of shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Peace meaning not turmoil with like with Satan, not with not with lies and deception that he's going to bring to this world soon, and very convincingly, may I add. Now, again, that day star, he's coming back. You see, this is the subject, the return of Christ and what it's going to be like. Okay, now that we did the New Testament, I want to go back to the book of Numbers. I want to see what it says about that star. Let 
Numbers chapter 24. And it says in verse uh, 17, you'll all remember this place because you've been through this not too long ago. So I'm going to just pick up there at Numbers 24, verse 17. And this has to do with the return of Messiah. Again, you want to know what it's going to be like? You know what's going to be happening? This is it. Verse 17 of uh, Deut Numbers 24. I shall see him, but not now. I shall behold him, but not nigh. There shall come a star. This means that day star, the morning star, Jesus Christ, out of Jacob. A scepter shall rise out of Israel. He was the king. And shall smite the corners of Moab and destroy all the children of Seth. Now, that doesn't make sense, and it shouldn't in your mind, because Seth are, are uh, decent people. The word Seth itself means confusion or tumult, and it should have been translated that way rather than the man's name. All right. Verse 18. And Edom shall be a possession... Edom, of course, being the land of Esau, which the prophecy in Revelation 27 still stands. Seir also shall be a possession of his, for his enemies, and Israel shall do valiantly, valiantly. 19. Out of Jacob shall come he that shall have dominion, and shall destroy him that remaineth of the city. That is to say, in opposition. Now for the next is the son of Esau, 20. And when he looked on Amalek, this is the son of Esau, he took up his parable and said, Amalek was the first of the nations, but his latter end shall be that he perish forever. Now, bear in mind, this is Old Testament. If any one of Amalek believes on Christ, they're saved. Okay, Let that be understood. It's a lot rougher for a Russian living under communism or at one time to be a Christian than you, dear friend. Okay, 21, sharpen up for me. And he looked on the Kenites and took up his parable and said, strong is thy dwelling place and thou puttest thy nest in a rock. You, you think you're on solid foundation and you've really built you a nice little nest that you work out of. 22, nevertheless, the Kenite shall be wasted Unto Asher, or the Syrian Antichrist, to you, shall carry thee away captive. Good old buddy, but he's going to do him in, okay? And he took up his parable and said, Alas, who shall live when God doeth this? I can tell you, you are. It's this generation. One more verse. And ships shall come from the coast of Chittim. Chittim means the bruisers, and God's election are called his bruisers, those Christians that are ready to bruise the serpent's head. First prophecy, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15. Are you a part of it? You got the standard? Whack him with it, all right? And shall afflict Asher, which is the Assyrian again, and shall afflict Eba, would be, and he also shall perish forever. In other words, there's coming a time that discernment, they're either going to make up their mind or they're, they're going into that lake of fire. Not a pleasant thing. But beloved, when the millennium is over, we want peace, right? I think we've earned it. We don't want troublemakers. If they've had their day. And I pray that each and every one of them, as God would say, come to repentance and are saved. Will they be? I don't think so. I tell you what, there are just some people that just seems like they're born to be bad. And I, I hate that. I really do. But you know what? You can try and try and try. And then you know why pretty soon you become an enabler if you try to help them. You become a part of it. You take some old boy. I'll just use a modern day example. Some old boy really gets hooked on pot or coke or some something. <laughs> And he comes to you with the saddest story you ever heard in your life about how he loves you and how he wants to change. And could you just loan me 50? Do you know what he's going to use that 50 for? Is to get another hit. And you did it. So you become an enabler. So you just, I don't know. It seems like, and I'm not judging any of your relatives. I hope to pray to God that they see the light. All right. But you, I'm just saying, this is the way some people are. They just seem like they can't help themselves, you know? So you have to use your own discernment in that. 
Where was I? Oh, I was here. Yeah, okay. Hmm. Okay, let's go back to Malachi and finish up here and learn what this is all really about, all right? Back to Malachi. I'm really running you all around. You're getting quite a Bible study on how to find yourself in the Bible, aren't you? That's good for you. Okay. <clears throat> okay, we got to that now. Verse 3, and you shall, uh, this is chapter 4, Malachi, verse 3, and you shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, saith the Lord of hosts. Do you know what that means? That's the day I take my action. So if you don't think I'm coming back, just stick around. I got my lye soap, I got my smelting pot, and I'm about ready to load up and head that way, and I'm bringing the book with me. God, I mean, friends, we're a lot closer to this than some might think. And I'll tell you what, it's a serious, serious thing. It really is. He's going to take action. And all these things we've covered are for your benefit to see signs. Because when those signs come forth, it's here. And you need to know that. Four, remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb, for all Israel with, with the statutes and judgments. This goes back to verse 7 of chapter 3. What did it say? Look over there real quick. Even from the days of your fathers, you have gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, I will return unto you. You know, you can't get any fairer than that. He's, he's willing to forgive and start over when I know a lot of us wouldn't. Okay. I, I know that our patience would be exhausted, but God through the sun, said seven times 70, which is like saying, uh, uh, you know, every time they repent, I'm going to forgive them as long as we haven't passed that date of the judgment. So, you know, we have a very good father. We have a forgiving father. So really, he said, please don't forget my word. That's what he's saying here. And, you know, it almost hurts me when I see people get caught up inside traps of nonsense, you know, of studying into rag sheets and things like that. When they've got the word of God and got the knowledge to use it, it's kind of sad, especially if it isn't documented stuff. Okay. I like history. I like news, but I'm talking about when you get into the vein of religion, this, this is, this is a reality here and this is what you need. Okay, verse 5, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And we know that John the Baptist would have, as it is written, have been that prophet had they accepted him. Did they? No, they cut his head off. They didn't accept Christ, and they, nor did they accept him. And Oh, Elijah in the Hebrew tongue means my God is Yah. My God is Yahweh. You can say that same thing because you love that name. You love our Father's name. He is your God. And you know the difference between Yah, Yahweh, that is to say, our Father, and Satan, Lucifer. You know, Lucifer means bright and morning star too, but God is touched you, and you know the difference. And that's precious. That's beautiful. Because as we continue on, verse 6, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children. There are two fathers, basically. The one pretends to be Satan and Almighty God. Now, they're both turning. Uh, Satan wants company. Oh, he's advertising He's advertising for membership. Join our little church and fly right out of here. Got you going. Now, I know a lot of people do that in innocence, and I'm not knocking them, but I'm saying Satan works heavier from Bible study sometimes than he does any other thing because he's got people in the right frame of mind. It happens, friend. That's why I always tell you don't listen to this man or any other man without checking him out in the Word of God. Grow grow skilled in this word, and you'll be a good servant of God. Have faith. Love Christ. Yes. But, hey, 
uh, grow skilled in the word. Uh, and he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Strange way to end the last, the Old Testament, right? I'll come and smite her with a curse. You think he won't? Now, naturally, the opposite side of that coin is to turn the children's hearts back to the correct father. That's your responsibility. Because any ministry that takes part in turning the children's hearts back to the true father and teaches the fact that there are two, the false and the true, you become a part of that ministry. You do. And it's a very important ministry. And are there all that many of them around? Well, you know, sometimes I think there are. And sometimes I get so many letters from people saying, I can't find nobody that has a church like y'all's. I've, I've, I've chased this whole town out and all they want to do is fly. You know, I just, I just can't find somebody teaching the Bible. They just want to talk all the time. So I don't know. That's you just have to always remember you're in church with with uh, the chapel because you are part of that church. When you plant a seed, you're turning the hearts of those children, and they're precious to God. Every one of those children, those unbelievers, and you know, don't don't ever get this idea that you're a goody goody two shoes and shut yourself off and think you're too good to witness to somebody. If they come to you, I don't mean stand on the corner and make a fool out of yourself, okay? But uh, uh, but if a friend or a relative, you know, I think that like when some family has a traumatic experience, if you can go over and say, dear one, you know the word says your loved one is with the father. You're going to have their attention. They're going to listen to you. You get some of these people, they'll go to church for 30 years sitting on that pew, and you ask them something about the Bible, and they don't know any more about it than the first day they went in there. Because the preacher's talked to them and has not been a teacher and forced them to work in the Word, whereby they could be useful. If I hired a bricklayer to lay brick, and he said, I've been under union 20 years, but I've never been out on the job, I'd say, bye, sucker, you ain't laying no bricks for me. Well, so it is. If you haven't got any experience in God's Word, I don't know why I should waste my time trying to talk Bible to you. Because it's a pleasure to me. I love to talk Bible, don't you? But you do want to talk to somebody that don't know his head from a hole in the ground. Or, no. It's, uh, well, whatever. <laughs> it, it's just not right. Okay? You like to enjoy a conversation. All right? Now, very serious. God said, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. He's going to do that. And it's important that you know what that curse is, because I don't want you to be a part of it. And that's really why you're hearing this message today. And I'm sorry if I'm running over. I never hold anybody over an hour because I know things can begin to get your attention, you know, pretty, pretty quick after you've been there a long time. But please bear with me as we're going to finish up here in, in Zechariah, the book right before Malachi. We're going to finish up in Zechariah chapter 5. And I'm going to do this rather rapidly because every one of you is familiar with it, okay? These are the prophecies of the end times. And this is the curse God is going to send. See that it doesn't draw you in. It is your prerogative to stay clear of it where it will have none effect upon you, but this curse shall come. This is that curse. And this is how he returns, and it's how you know he's right on the heels of this event. Chapter 5, verse 1, Then I turned and I lifted up mine eyes, and I looked, and behold, a flying roll. There was a signboard out there flying across that sky, and how big was it, too? And he said unto me, What seest thou? And I answered, I see a flying roll. The length thereof is 20 cubits, and the breadth thereof 10 cubits. It's 30 by 15. It's amazing that that's the same size of the Holy of Holies. I said, it's amazing that that is the same size as the Holy of Holies. Because God's Word is out there. That sign is out there. The truth is, and it flies. 
three. Then said he unto me, we have television in many ways that signs fly. Then said he unto me, this is the curse. I want to read that again. I want, I want you to wake up for me. I want you to be sharp. This Then said he to me, this is the curse that goeth forth over the face of the whole earth. For everyone that stealeth shall be cut off as on this side according to it, and everyone that sweareth shall be cut off as on that side according to it. Swears to falsehoods, swears to things, the false Christ rather than the true Christ, steals uh, people's lineage, their inheritance, by taking the truth from them, lying to them about the order and the chronological order of events that Christ taught about his return, meaning by that I mean the false Christ comes first. For I will bring it forth, saith the Lord of hosts, and it shall enter into the house of the thief and into the house of him that sweareth falsely by my name. By Christ's name, swears falsely. Well, I know this is what Jesus said because he talked to me this morning. He told me that you all should eat chocolate ice cream tonight. Swears from the Lord. The Lord talked to me and I talked to him. Now, preachers do that playing one-upmanship to make you think that God really loves them and instructs them. I'm going to tell you something. God has spoken to me a time or two, and I ain't telling you about it. It's not a joyous thing necessarily. A few years, you might quit shaking, you know. But uh, it's not something, and God doesn't have time to mess around with idiots. And here, I shouldn't use that term, but I'm out of time. I'm running out of time. I'm getting late, and I want to get it said, okay? Um, he said that falsely by my name, and it shall remain in the midst of his house and shall consume it with the timber thereof and the stones thereof. It's in the book, friends, to whose house goes and whose house stays. It's in the book. Then the angel that talked with me went forth and said unto me, lift up now thine eyes and see what, what is this that goeth forth. This is the curse. It's coming. And I said, what is it? And he said, this is the neat house. It's a big old basket that goeth forth. And he said, moreover, this is their resemblance throughout all the earth. This is how you're going to be able to spot them. Seven, and behold, there was lifted up a talon of lead. That's a heavy lead, a disc. And there, and this is a woman that sitteth in the midst of the five. Oh, mystery Babylon, the woman that thought the false Christ was the real one. Languishing in confusion, lies about who Christ is in the chronological order of his return. Naturally, if Satan comes back first saying, I'm going to fly you away. And look what happens to this woman. And he said, this is wickedness. It's the lawless one. And he cast it into the midst of the ephah, and he cast the weight of lead upon the mouth thereof. He broke it, okay? Then lifted I up mine eyes and looked, and behold, there came out two women, and the wind was in their wings for they had wings like the wings of a stork and they lifted up the ephah between the earth and the heaven that's Jesus. that's the false jesus saying i'm rapturing you all right out of here with my pretty little women here right it's going to happen friend they're going to think they're flying away to save their souls but it's not written in god's word except to say it's a curse it is written in another place, in Ezekiel chapter 13, where God says, I'm against those that teach my people to fly to save their souls. Why? It leads them to Antichrist. It's a curse. It's coming. And that's the main number one clue that you know to the return of the true Christ. It won't be until after this mess happens. God said it. It is so. It is written in the book. And you have been warned. Uh, avoid it. It doesn't mean anything to you. It doesn't affect you because you're not going to be deceived. Then said I to the angel that talked with me, whither do these things, whither do these bear the ephah? Where are they flying off to? 11. And he said unto me, 
to build it in house in the land of Sinar. Do you know what that is in the Hebrew? Babylonia. It's a little trick name for Babylonia. Little Babylon of the book of Revelation. And it shall be established and set there upon her base. Just don't have any part of her. The curse shall come. That is your main clue. When Christ said, when God said, where and how is my coming? This is it, friend. Like it, lump it. I'm watching. I'm writing it in the book. Where are you going to be? We're getting close, friends. God loves you. He's proud of you. Don't let him down. Hey, as we said this morning on the night of the crucifixion, everybody ran. I cannot visualize this group running from anything. I can visualize them running to something to help, to the truth, to serve God, to, to absorb his word. I know you because I deal with you. We, we couldn't be possible if it weren't for you. You're important, but you're more important to God. It's in the book. And boy, do you look good there. I'm going to tell you what. There, listen, there's a reason. And I'll just talk just one more second about Shepherd's Chapel. And I didn't intend to do this. And God help me. Don't any of you take this as bragging. It's not. It's God's gift. All right. <laughs> Because of you, Shepherd's Chapel doesn't have to have telephones. Do you know that I have orders that never, ever is there to be a telephone run on SCN? And if I should die tomorrow, I'll revolve in my grave if somebody had one afterwards. Why? If, you're, if you can't teach God's Word good enough without begging, then you're not a teacher. All right. I believe that. I practice it. So it is you that makes that possible. I don't think I'm not aware of that. And I love you for it. I wanted you to know that. As I'm winding down here, what a fall fellowship. But this is what God wants you to know. All right. And I love you a big bunch for that. You do make it possible. Hey, I know you're in the book. That's why I can say that. And that's why I can just speak right out to you and say, I love you.